We've gotten so smart that we're dangerously stupid and we're right on the edge of many disasters. Mm -hmm. And the coronavirus is, is a, a distraction from much, much bigger issues. So welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. And today we interview Mr. Paul Check. Um, the purpose of this episode was really to help people that are going through a difficult time at the moment and to give them some simple things that they could do that are free to, to help prepare themselves, their bodies, and to be able to have a positive impact on other people. Switch off for negative news, and this is, this is a real wonderful and powerful episode that I think will have a huge impact on many, many people. The first part of the interview, we just talk about um, Paul's view on the corona situation itself. And then in the second half, we, we Paul talks about some real practical information, step by step, simple things that you can do and put in place in your life and share with your family just to make you feel better, stronger, and more able to deal with what's going on at the moment. So hope you enjoy the episode. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Please contact me on social media with any thoughts and comments and suggestions, and please enjoy this episode. Well, Paul, thank you very much for agreeing to do this uh, interview today. I hope you're, uh, you're very uh, well and healthy over in San Diego. Strong and vital as ever. I haven't <laughs> missed a day of work in 36 years due to illness. None of this stuff scares me. <laughs> so you're corona resilient or, or corona immune, are you? Well, you know, I think it's beyond corona. I think it's really, uh, you know... If you're healthy, you're healthy, and you have a healthy immune system. And you know, Corona is just one of a myriad of potential opportunistic organisms in the environment. They're there all the time. It's just that this one's got a political agenda attached to it. So um, I won't, you know, sidetrack us with that. But I'm saying uh, it's really just another opportunistic organism, and healthy people, you know. If you get it, you're going to get, you know, some flu-like symptoms. You'll, if you practice healthy living, then your immune system will build antibodies and, you, and you'll be on your way, just like any other infectious organism. Hmm. What was your thoughts on it then? Is it because, I, you know, you read so much and yet it's certainly the media at the moment seems to be going wild with all different kinds of information and conflicted information. You know, from, from your perspective, Ben, is it, although I'm you know, taken away from the seriousness of what's happening and the, and the pressure it's putting on the health service at the moment. But, you know, is, is, this, is this another one of many diseases, like you say, that are out there? It just happens to be one that's, that's very contagious? Or, or you know, what's, what's your assessment of, of, of what's happening at the moment? Well, you know, really, to, to give you my honest answer to that, you have to get into all sorts of, of uh, viewpoints of experts around the world, and there's a lot of them. Um, you know, when you look, the, the way I'm going to approach that for you is if you look, if you had to estimate the health of the average individual on the planet right now, 10 being excellent health, uh, zero being dead, where would you say the average person's at on the scale of health? Well, I, it was funny, my wife and I were talking about this at the weekend, and I, I, I googled um, obesity, just this one one disease. And, and apparently, there was like in America, something like 39% of Americans are obese, which I guess classes them, uh, you know, seriously sick, I guess, if you're obese, you're very unhealthy. And I suppose if this is a disease that hits the unhealthy, then potentially 40% of the American population are at risk because of the fact that they're already unhealthy. So I, I suppose, you know, if you added up everything, heart disease and obesity and all those, then I, I would say, you know, a big percentage of, certainly in America, um, of people are, are already sick anyway. Is, is, you know, is well, that fair? yes, and, and, and uh, Australia has higher rates of obesity than the United States. Uh, really? England's got higher rates of chronic inflammatory diseases and chronic illnesses than the United States does as well. So, you know, when you look at the, the industrialized nations around the world, most people are eating garbage. Most people are sleep deprived. Most people are living in fear-based thinking. Most, you know, uh, research I looked into years ago, I actually um, listened to a podcast that was run by a friend of mine named Don Bodenbach, who used to have a health radio show. He interviewed uh, a, a guy with a master's degree in public health who cited statistics from research he'd done that showed only 3% of women and 8% of men worldwide 
do any regularly scheduled exercise, including walking a dog. So you got 92% of men and 97% of women who are completely sedentary. Most people don't breathe properly because they're holding on to all sorts of emotional problems and musculoskeletal imbalances, inflammatory issues, and eating sugar. Anytime you're eating sugar, it'll screw your respiratory rate right up, push it way up high because oxygen is the chief mechanism for alkalinizing the bloodstream and sugar acidifies the blood process. Sugar acidifies the bloodstream rapidly and the blood has to be regulated at a very tight pH of about 7.34 or 3.5. And so if you look at the nutrition, people are living off of garbage, animal food, pet food is maintains much higher industry standards than human food. That's a known fact. In fact, it's harder to become a veterinarian than it is to be a doctor for human beings. To get into veterinary school is much tougher than it is to get into medical school to be a doctor for human beings. Hydration, most people are significantly dehydrated. They don't drink much water. They drink tea, juice, soda pop, beer, alcohol, and all sorts of toxic processed pasteurized garbage sleep so we got nutrition hydration sleep the average person out there is at least an hour a night sleep deprived the average college students only getting 4.7 hours of sleep a night if you want to put this in perspective if you look at the research on the cost per day or per year of injuries and payouts to the, from the government and compensation boards due to Injuries track directly back to sleep discrepancy. It's in the multi, multi billions of dollars a year. So when you consider how many people dying, cutting fingers off, crashing cars just from sleep alone, it makes this whole coronavirus look like a joke. If you look at the number of people that are dying from heart disease or car accidents or, uh, you know, heart disease or chronic inflammatory disease or obesity. When you start looking at how many people die every day from things that we just pr pretty much ignore because we've become numb to in the government and the medical systems making truckloads of money off of it. And then you put that against the coronavirus. This is an absolute joke. If we were really concerned about people's health, there's a myriad of things we would have been jumping on a long time ago, and so would the government. So then we talk about breathing. I talked about that. Most people don't breathe properly. They can't breathe properly because of diet, structural and health, and emotional, unhealed emotions. And, you know, breathing's the most, oxygen's the most essential nutrient for survival. You got about, you know, unless you're Wim Hof, you got about five minutes without it before your brain starts to die. Um, breathing pattern disorders are wickedly common. And I've seen them even in the greatest athletes in the world, and they cause a wide range of symptoms from digestive, eliminative, psychological, neurological. The list is very long. Um, thinking, we, we have a worldwide population that's trapped in religious programming and fear-based fear thinking as a general rule of thumb. Most people spend uh, Deepak Chopra once cited research showing that the average person thinks 68,000 thoughts a day, and other researchers found that on average 90% of them are negatively oriented. So when you look at the fact that as far as your cells are concerned, your mind is God, and it's easy to show that if you tell somebody to smile and they can smile, their whole body believes they're happy. But if you frown or you think, poor me, or the virus is going to get me, your whole body believes it. And when you look at the research on placebo studies, placebo studies that are used in medicine all the time, you can't get a drug to pass the FDA if it doesn't at least match or outperform a placebo. And research shows that the placebo effect is effective between 34 and 68% of the time, depending on whose study you, you read. So the point is, you've got a 34 to 60 something percent chance of getting healthy from any given disease when they give you a, a pill that has nothing but, you know, an, an inert substance like, you know, powdered sugar or something, and you think it's the medicine. They've even proven this with sham surgeries where they've opened people up 
all they did was cut their skin open and close them back up. And they've done this for back injuries, knee injuries, and all sorts of things. And the placebo effect holds its statistic validation even on structural issues where people have serious back problem and they do a sham surgery. And because they believe they've been operated on, their pain goes away and they function just like they had the actual surgery or better because they weren't actually surgically operated on. They were just opened. So Deepak Chopra probably 20 years ago was the first one to really tell people to be careful not to fall into the trap of the nocebo. So a placebo means you can give somebody a drug or a herb or a substance that's actually not even that substance, but because they believe it, they've got a 34 to 60 something percent chance of healing because their mind believes it. But Deepak Chopra made it clear that the nocebo effect means if you believe that SARS or, or coronavirus or any other illness is in the air and your friends got it and you start watching the television, listening to the radio, reading the newspapers, and you say, oh, my God, there's an epidemic. Everybody's got it. And you see someone cough and you think, oh, my God, I got it. You're, you, you can use the placebo effect against yourself and manifest the disease. In fact... Mm. A number of years ago, I was researching into this, and I found in one of my books a discussion by a doctor who w is a, was uh, studying theosophy. And when he read about this, he didn't believe it. So he thought, well, I'm going to test it. So he told his wife that he was going to do this with his, I think, eight or nine-year-old boy. And he also got the school teacher to participate in this experiment. His little boy got up met him, dad, at the breakfast table, as always. And dad says to him, you look like you're coming down with the flu. Are you feeling okay? And he says, I, I feel fine. So then he ate breakfast. And mom says, oh, honey, you're looking like you're getting a little hot. You look like you might be coming down with the flu. He says, no, I feel fine. Then he went to school, and he had the school teacher say the same thing to the kid. And within a couple of hours, the kid started to feel sick, had an elevated temperature, and had all the signs and symptoms of the flu. And then when they told the kid what had happened, the symptoms abated. So even a, even a medical doctor tested this on his own child and showed how powerful the placebo effect was, which he did because he doubted it would even work. So he didn't realize he could actually trigger these kinds of reactions in his child because he went into it doubting it. Mm. So what's so the you, key point? Yeah, go on, sorry. The key point is that your mind is as powerful as God. There's nothing more powerful than a belief and if you believe everything that you see and read, well, one, you're highly, highly gullible. And you don't pay attention to the fact that there's billions and billions of dollars being made by corporations every day to make you think that you need certain things or that you're lacking this or, you're, or you've got this. And uh, all you got to do is look into the uh, medical diagnostics manual. They've created a diagnosis for everything from, you know, picking your nose to video game playing, anything they can manufacture a drug for, they create a criteria to turn it into a disease, and then they program people on television to believe they have this, these symptoms, so therefore they need the pill. Hmm. I mean, all you got to do is study the history and the science of marketing, and it can, it's very, very dangerous because our culture is too lazy to think, and they don't know how to think. We've got an education system that programs people what to think, tells them what to think, but doesn't teach them how to think. So just, so, just for a second, Paul, on the going back to the, 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 the situation with Corona. So, so obviously what you're saying is like, you know, there are several other things that are killing millions of people. Um, it, 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 with what's going on here, obviously, undeniably, a lot of people are dropping down like, like flies, you know, if you look at places like Italy and that, it's, it's, you know, completely taken them over. So, you know, what do you think is different here? Is it just that this has moved at such a rapid speed, be, you know, beyond what people are able to, to cope with that, you know, some of the um, mechanisms that people would have to, to deal with this are, are not there? What, you know, what, what, what's different about this com compared to some of the other things that, yes, are killing millions of people and have done for a long time, like obesity, heart disease, you know, what, where, where does this sit on that? And, and what's, what's unique about this situation, do you think? Well, what's unique, the, the research I've looked into says that this actual virus isn't any stronger or more dangerous than a typical flu virus. But when you get enough people believing that they're under threat, it scares the hell out of them, which pushes their 
adrenaline and cortisol levels through the roof, puts them on a total fight or flight, which shuts down your parasympathetic nervous system. So you can't repair, you can't regenerate effectively. It taxes the immune system. If it's held, if the cortisol is held up chronically, it shuts the immune system down. That's well known. One teaspoon of sugar is shown to shut down the immune system for six hours and think of that alone. So, and that's processed sugar, of course, not natural sugar. But when you get a bunch of people that start believing and they're starting to lump many different diagnoses in as the coronavirus and publish the statistics, which of course leads people who may just have a cold or a flu thinking they've got the coronavirus and the testing is not specific enough to differentiate. That's one thing many of the experts have said. So what you get is mass hysteria. You get people really freaking out. And then the more people they hear going to the hospital, the more worried they get and the more protective they try to get and the more negative and fearful thinking they have. And then that causes stress reactions, which leads people to using coping mechanisms like drinking more alcohol, smoking, smoking more cigarettes, eating more sugar and junk food. And so what they do is they take the normal everyday way of living and they accelerate it massively due to the stress reaction. And the consequence of that is, is you have the nocebo effect. You have the poor health magnified. You have lack of sleep because people can't think straight. They start hyperventilating because they're scared to death and they believe everything they're seeing and reading like it's fact. And they trust people wearing white suits like they really do care for them, forgetting that this whole thing's part of a massive, massive industry that makes billions and billions of dollars off these tactics, which drug commercials and, you know, there's mountains of research into all these issues I'm talking about. This is by no means anything new. Um, that's how you know when you have a really good weapon, when you can use it right in front of people and they don't even realize what's happening. So personally, I don't think that the coronavirus is any more of a threat than any, any flu. It, the difference is people get the flu all the time and their mental orientation to it is it's the flu. So you go to bed, you eat some chicken soup, you let, it, let your immune antibodies build up. And if we were approaching this, in a rational, sane manner without, without all the hype, you would see that the number of deaths and the number of people reacting to it would be no different than any other day because we always have flus going around. We always have various bugs. There's a, you know, a myriad of things that move through um, a populace worldwide and they always have. That's why they're called opportunistic diseases. Hmm. So do those diseases, like from what you know, and I'm nowhere near an expert, but do, is, you know, if you look at Corona as a, as a, as a sort of a, a this virus, are, do, do, do viruses generally behave in the same way as Corona, um, you know, in terms of their, in, you know, how, how you get affected, you know, by being near people and that sort of thing? Or, you know, does this one behave differently from what you know? And I know, I know maybe this is not your... No, I'm know. not a virologist, but from everything I've read looking into all this and people that I've talked to that are experts, and I've read a number of articles, you know, a great place to get real solid information on this is Green Med Info. Um, I think it's greenmedinfo.com. It's run by Sawyer G. Um, and he's got all sorts of top epidemiologists and experts writing articles. And a lot of the things I'm saying are coming right from the articles there, such as that the testing's not accurate. Um, even recently on mainstream media, uh, uh, Penny told me that, I don't know if it was the CBC or BBC, but a couple of mainstream media uh, outlets have actually come out in public and stated that the numbers of people infected are probably grossly overestimated due to the fact that the testing's not being done correctly. And so... Mm -hmm. The answer is, you know, viral infections have been around forever. But let me give you, uh, let me tell you something that really puts this into very clear perspective. Years ago, when I was doing research to write my book, Under the Veil of Deception, what Uncle Sam isn't telling you about organic food and organic farming, I came across a very powerful article in an uh, environmental journal. And this is about 2001 or two. And what had recently happened, which is what the article was about, that off the coast of Maine here in the United States, 
5,000 seals and sea lions died, and there was dead seals and sea lions all over the place. And the marine biologists investigated to find out what was killing all these sea animals. What they found out, it was a virus that's very common in the ocean, has been around for as long as scientists have been monitoring these things. So you have to say, well, then what killed them? Care to guess what killed them? Why they died of a virus that they, can, that they normally never have a problem with? Um, well, I guess something in the environment changed, um, changed how they responded to it, maybe. I'm not... They tracked it back to chemicals from oil spills, industrial right. dumping, and sewage dumping in the ocean, and manufacturing. And they showed beyond a shadow of a doubt that the immune systems of sea creatures worldwide are so weak due to the chemicals that we've put into the ocean, they cannot even defend themselves against pathogens that are completely normal in their environment. So the reason the virus got them is because their immune systems had gotten so weak they couldn't defend themselves. Okay, how is that any different than the soup of chemical toxicity that we're living in and 5G wireless systems, which are well known to be extremely stressful to the body, to heat the body up, inflame the body, and a long list of other things from toxins in the buildings, toxins in body care products, toxins in food supply, toxins in the water supply, toxins in the air. Um, I mean, when you, when you actually look at what we've done to the planet in the name of scientific advancement and consider that we're actually living in a chemical cocktail probably worse than the sea creatures are because the sea the sea is two-thirds of the of the surface of the earth the land mass is one-third so the point i'm making is we've poisoned the land which is one-third of the mass of the earth and we haven't poisoned the sea nearly as much as we've poisoned our own soils and our own environment. And we eat garbage as a daily practice, but sea creatures eat their natural diet and they're still getting wiped out. So, mm. but you see, nobody was on headline news saying we have a viral epidemic killing off sea lions and seals because they sure as hell wouldn't want you to know what was causing it. So with, we, I know you've mentioned um, in one of your recent videos that you've done about the organic side. So in terms of food, you know, people thinking that they're eating healthily, um, but you, you, were, you were sort of citing that, you know, some of these, you know, what people think is organic is, is, you know, some of it is, you know, real organic and real organic. It's, you know, there's different parts to that. And some, you know, some of these companies that are giving labels are actually backed by businesses, um, you know, like that, that have sugar products you know to, to tell us oh, a little bit about it's, that it's a joke there's only a few organizations in the world that are legitimately the legitimate organic certifiers the key thing is to be in a legitimate organic certification body which i believe the british soil association has one demeter is the gold standard worldwide for organic certifications that's the biodynamic standard usda is not a bad one but to be certified organic by a real organization, you have to pay usually about $6,000 a year, which includes a soil scientist coming to your property and testing your soils for any chemicals that cannot be in organic food or soil. Then they identify those chemicals. Then you, they, give you the, they give you coaching on the right things to add to the soil and the right microorganisms to try to clear the toxins. There's a two year grace period. Once you have been found to have toxic soils, you have to farm organically and balance the soils. And it takes two years for most microorganisms to metabolize those toxins. So you'll pass your certification. You're not allowed to sell your food as certified organic in that time. You can call it organic, but you cannot sell it as certified organic until they come out and retest your soils and find that your soils are clean and meet the standards of true organic certification. Now, any other organization claiming to be organic out there is just charging a fee for a label that you stick on your food and you call it certified organic. So here's the punchline. Who has organic certifications today that's selling food to all of you? How about Cargill? Cargill is a food pro uh, trucking company, one of the biggest in the world. How about Kellogg's 
the Kellogg company, Kellogg's Corn Flakes? How about Pepsi Cola? How about Coca Cola? How about Hershey's? How about Mars bars? Um, the, uh, the, the writing's so small on this thing, I can't read it, but uh, um, maybe my other one's better. Here we go. So we've got ConAgra, General Mills, M&M and Mars Bar, uh, Post Foods, Dannon, Hershey Foods, Hershey as in Hershey chocolate bars, J.M. Smucker, the company that makes jam. Um, we've got, I'm, there's, a, there's about a hundred of them on here, so I'm just choosing the ones that most people know. J&J &J Snack Foods. So what are Boston. these companies that they've, they've got? They're, they're, these are all, these are food processing companies. These are their junk food manufacturers. You, you tell me you don't know who Coca-Cola and- No, and I, I know, I know who they are. So, so what is it? They've got, they've created their own organic certification label. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So what they right. do, and this has been researched, they also are in the farming, the, the food farming industry. They have big interest in commercial farming. Mm -hmm. So these companies start their own so-called organic farms, but what they're doing is then getting their own scientists at universities with agricultural departments that they fund to do research on their organic food and compare it to their commercial food, which you don't even know is coming from Mars Bar, Cadbury, Coca-Cola, because it's under a different name, a standard food name that for, from a large farming conglomerate. So you don't know who's behind it. That's what this chart tells you is who's actually the money provider, who's the owner of these shell companies. And so then they do scientific research. And what people don't know is they've actually are funding the university that's doing the research they compare so-called commercially purchased food, which comes from their commercial farm against their so-called organic farm under a different name, which is also their food, farmed identically under the disguise of organic. And then they publish research that shows there's no difference between commercially farmed and organic food. And then they put it into the media and it's on television, on radio and in the newspapers. And they've been doing this for years. In fact, the British Soil Association found 128 studies looking at the difference between commercially raised and organic food. And something like, I'm just, it's been years since I read it, something like 57 of those studies said there was no difference between commercially farmed and organic. The British Soil Association got a panel of scientists, highly qualified scientists together. There was over 20 scientists, if I remember right, on the panel. They took all 128 studies and analyzed them for validity of scientific design. In other words, could the study even give that information? Of the 128 studies they evaluated, only 28 were deemed scientifically valid, 100% of which showed significant differences in nutrition in organic versus commercial food. And then if you follow the money to who was publishing all the studies that they deemed were not scientifically valid, you get right to these people I just mentioned. So how do you know, how do you know then, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have the time or, or knowledge to even work that out, you know, so how does, to, you know, people figure out, you know, if it says organic, you think it's organic. How, how do you, how do you sort of work your way through that mess then? <laughs> well, it is a mess. And that's why I teach my students how to use muscle testing, connecting to their soul, how to spend time doing things like Tai Chi, Qigong and meditation to get consciously in touch with your internal instinctual systems, right? So let me ask you this. If you walk into a public bathroom, when you smell the smell in there, does it smell like healthy people have been pooping in there? Does it smell like sick people have been pooping in there? <laughs> yeah, I think I think you all know the answer to that one. Yeah, right. <laughs> but you, you know, when a poop, when a person has a healthy poop, it smells naturally like earth and soil. It's not it's not in, invasive at all. It smells like healthy poop. And intu intuitively, most people know that when their poop smells really bad and their stomach doesn't feel good, they think, wow, some kind of bug's trying to get me. But the point I'm making is we all have instinctual awareness, but we've been so caught in our heads with all the rat race of the world and all the media and all the time on phones and computers that we now live in the mental realm and we completely disconnect from our bodies. We don't poop when we need to poop. We don't pee when we need to pee. We don't eat when we should be eating. And when we do eat, we eat junk and we drink, we drink garbage. 
And so we actually train ourselves to ignore the technology that Mother Nature built right into us. So what's the point? If you spend any time eating real food, and, and by the way, wh what you have to do now is go to farmer's markets to find real food. And many of them don't buy organic certifications because of this exact issue, but they still farm organically. Mm -hmm. So you just ask them, is this food farmed with chemicals? Most of them will tell you straight up. If it's not farmed with chemicals, technically it's organic unless it's been farmed on poison soil. But the point I'm making is if you just go look for, for people growing real food and you taste the carrots, you taste the peppers, you taste the vegetables, and you eat the meat. And when you eat meat from free range organic animals, you taste the depth of the flavor. You can feel the mineral content you actually then take that experience and go eat something from the store from a commercial farm and it tastes like you're eating cardboard. <laughs> People don't know the difference because they haven't taken the time to actually pay attention to how important food is. And so they're so used to eating garbage that they don't know the difference anyhow. But anybody that's eaten real food for any period of time immediately notices the difference. In fact, I've had situations where we were having parties like for Mana, our four-year-old boy, and we would put out certified organic vegetables and yogurt dip and, you know, the kinds of stuff that would be at a party for my child. And the parents bring kids over and all of a sudden their kid that normally hates vegetables is eating raw broccoli and <laughs> loving it. And they do, the parents are like, my kid never eats vegetables. I don't know what's going on here. What's it? What is it? I said, well, it's because these are real vegetables and the child's intuition and gut is telling him there's nutrition he needs in there. Hmm. When you put children around real food, all of a sudden they start eating all sorts of stuff they don't normally eat because intuitively, instinctually, they know that the vegetables that are being fed to them are don't have anything in them. So you, if you're going to go that route, then why not eat something that tastes good like uh, cocoa pops or yeah, that's right. Snickers bars, right? Yeah. And they've done the same thing in animal studies. They've put commercially raised food out for animals. Then they put food that was raised with no chemicals, but no, no um, fertilizer added to the soil. And then they put organically raised food that had proper fertilizer added to the soil. And they did this with grains. It's right in the book, um, the Living Soil and the Holly Experiment by Lady Eve Balfour, which she published in about 1946 or 7, and there's many other studies showing this. Um, and I've got videos documenting this with cows doing the same thing. The animals always go right to the top quality food first. They will eat the organic food raised with manure, and only when it's completely gone will they go to the middle range food and only when there's no other choice will they eat the commercially raised food. In fact, it's well known amongst cattle farmers that if there's non-chemically raised grasses outside the fence that the cows are grazing on, they will practically kill themselves sticking their heads through the barbed wire trying to get at the grass outside the pasture until they can't eat any more and only then will they eat the stuff on the soils that have been sprayed with chemicals like Roundup and other herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, and rodenticides. The animals know. Why? Because they're not trapped in their head and they haven't been convinced by a lot of silliness that food is something that you shop for like you shop for gasoline. So you see, when you add all this up, human beings on average are sitting targets for not only viruses, but anything that's in the environment, which is why I brought up the study showing what happened to the sea lions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we have these problems going on in nature all the time. Entomologists recently identified something very shocking. And they, the title of the research paper was Armageddon may be near. They started noticing that bug traffic was dropping down all over the world at all their research sites. So when the, one of the key chief entomologists, I think he was from Europe, started noting this. So he started connecting to entomologists, which are, you know, insect experts all over the world and asking them to check correlations in their records. Well, they got together and did a study and their research showed that bug traffic worldwide 
is 50 to 75% lower than it was something like 20 years ago. That's the sex organs of the planet. That's why they called, they said Armageddon may be near, may be near. and they tracked it right back to pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and rodenticides are killing all the insects, which are the sex organs of the planet. And this goes right back to large companies like Monsanto, Bayer, and all these large chemical corporations convincing farmers that that's how you farm for billions and trillions of dollars of profit well, we've completely destroyed our soil. And I talked about this in my podcast with Dave Murphy from Food Democracy Now. And so what, what you, when you really look at it, we're killing off the sex organs of the planet. Bees are, are fading out seriously fast. Rudolf Steiner said in, in the early 1900s, human life depends upon two things, bees and trees. And if either of them reach a critical level, life on Earth will cease to exist as you know it. Well, we're cutting down millions of acres a day in the rainforest. We've deforested the whole planet, chemicalized it, and we're wiping the bee population out, which has been tracked back right to two things, pesticides and electromagnetic pollution stressing the hell out of them. And so, you know, what am I really saying? If you want to know why we're having this epidemic, if it is an epidemic, as opposed to a, a corporate hoax, it's because of these things. Mm. Right. And, 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 and it'll just be one epidemic after the other, which gives them exactly what they want. When you look at what we've done to nature and you pay attention, well, we should be much more concerned about the fact that we're almost at a critical point where there's going to be no bees left on the planet. And here's something to show you how ridiculous corporations can be. I saw an article where a company offered a solution to that. They're a robotics company. And they said that for X billion dollars, they could produce robotic bees <laughs> and wanted the government to buy billions of robotic bees that were supposed to fly around in nature and do the pollinating. <laughs> that, I, the only thing I can say is that, excuse the expression, that's how fucking dumb we've gotten. <laughs> Like, I look at this, I grew up on a farm, as you know, I look at all this PhD, master's degree, genius silliness going on and go, you know what, as Lao Tzu said, if you sharpen a knife too much, it gets dull. And we've gotten so smart that we're dangerously stupid and we're right on the edge of many disasters. Mm -hmm. And the coronavirus is is a, a distraction from much, much bigger issues. We should be using our militaries not to fight each other, but to clean the soils, stop the use of fossil fuels, stop the use of dangerous chemicals, start reforestation programs, clean the waterways. Our really, what, what threatens us is us and yeah. large corporations. And if we used our military to really protect us, we'd have a chance of turning this thing around instead of spending trillions of dollars on, uh, you know, on, on the illusion of threats, mm. many of which are funded by the United States. I mean, look at uh, Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. You know, you do your research. They were funded by the United States government, the CIA, and we turn out to create our own enemies by doing these stupid things. So, so with this in mind, then, obviously, I, I suppose... You know, it's really for us in, as individuals to be able yeah. to prepare ourselves and to deal with it. So, uh, you know, if, if, if people are probably listening to this or watching this at home, um, you know, they are probably in a similar position to what you said. You know, maybe they're fearful, maybe their diets are not right, maybe they're not sleeping correctly. What what can we do as individuals to, I suppose, to prepare ourselves to be um, as as good as we can to deal with? you know, this, this disease that's out there and to, and to be able to, I suppose, you know, think through this and, and to make some sort of positive difference, even if it's just a person at a time um, to, to kind of, you know, to, to, to change these things just on a simple level, you know, how, how can we prepare ourselves for what's going on with the Corona and, you know, in, in the key areas that you talk about? Well, as you know, I did a 55 minute presentation on my YouTube channel on exactly that uh, two weeks ago now or a week and a half ago. But really, you know, change at the global level be begins with each individual. That's why I tell all my students, if you want to change the world for sure, change yourself. And you've got to guarantee the world's a better place. 
So really, when you, you know, my holistic lifestyle coaching program, I teach six foundation principles, which we just talked about nutrition. If you're going to spend money on food, find the best possible food you can or the best possible food you can afford. If you don't know what that is, guess what? That's your biggest, most important task. Where do I find good food and good water? You can go to findaspring.com and find high quality water sources pretty much anywhere in the world. You and on start. sorry, just on on water, are you, you know, is are you saying then that just you know standard regular bottled water isn't probably, or is that is that fine just as long as you're drinking water? Uh, there's research showing that on average, uh, bottled water is no better and no cleaner than tap water because the same corporations that I just talked about are playing the games with water too. They bottled tap water, they might run it through a filtration system and sell it to you, but when when experts have looked at bottled water and compared it to tap water in most cities, they found it was no better and sometimes worse because of bacterial contamination inside of plastic can containers. And it actually, unfortunately, most people don't know this, it takes three times as much water as the bottle holds to make the plastic that it's contained in. <laughs> and then when you look at what we're doing to the environment with all the plastics, that's another shocker. But, you know, I buy my water in glass because fortunately I have a, a local company, Palomar Water, that delivers it in glass. There's different grades of plastic. So on the bottle, there's a number. The higher the number, the harder, harder it is. It's in a little recycle symbol. And I talk about water in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, and how to differentiate good water from not so good water. But another thing to do today is, is just go to a camping store you know, here we have Adventure 16 and places like that, wherever you buy camping supplies. And they've actually now got quite good um, charcoal filters and other filters so that when you're out hiking and camping, you can just scoop water out of a stream and it goes through a filter or they got systems where you suck it through a straw and it pu pulls it through a filtration system. And that way people can go to tap water and use a, a, a filter and get better water than they're usually paying for in, in plastic bottles. Uh, you know, there are good companies out there like Avion is a good one. Fiji is one I like. Um, there's a there's a few of them. I'd have to, I haven't uh, bought water in a long time. But um, so the point I'm making is if we do our very best to get the best food we can get, and I tell people all the time, if you don't have enough money to buy um, animal or flesh foods, be it fish or uh, animals from free range, uh, non-toxic, uh, farmers like uh, free range non, non uh, free range organic farms then it's better to spend your money on organic free range meats because animals are bioaccumulators so animals accumulate toxins a cow has to eat a lot of toxic grass to make a pound of meat uh, research suggests on average uh, most animals have to eat six pounds of vegetables to produce one pound of muscle meat so if you're dealing with animals that are on commercial farms, you're talking about an animal that's bioaccumulating massive amounts of toxins into the flesh. So it's far safer to spend your money on fish and meat that's coming from either wild caught sources or from uh, free range, non-toxic sources. And then just do things like cleaning the produce well, skinning the skins off of it, keeping your hands clean because if you touch it, the surface and then touch other touch it after you skinned it it'll just get re and, and you know just poison the thing so you got to wash your your fruit and vegetables with a fruit and vegetable watch which i show how to do in my book how to eat move and be healthy so in other words what i'm saying is if you have a, a cost issue then always go for the highest quality flesh foods because they carry the most toxins and therefore they're the greatest threat to your immune system and your viability getting uh, as much sleep as you can is the cheapest, most powerful form of medicine there is, bar none. If you look at the research on what sleep deprivation does to people, it can cause almost anything. And because it, it uh, depletes your body's ability to repair itself and shut your immune system down, it makes you highly susceptible to any illness if you're sleep deprived. So with all the people working at home and, and having more freedom right now, it's nap time, it's sleep time. People shouldn't be staying up late at night, smoking, drinking, and eating junk food. They should be sleeping. And to the degree they're worried about getting the coronavirus, they should make sleeping and napping highly important.
because it is man's best form of medicine and it always has been. You know, I've studied medicine going all the way back to ancient healers and people like Galen and Hippocrates and, and many others, and all of them spoke about the importance of sleep. Uh, so, and what is, a, what is a good amount of sleep that we should be having? And I know there's different types of sleep, and I know sometimes people wake up in that, but what, you know, is there, is there a sort of a basic rule that you, you know, a simple one that you can follow in terms of that? Yes, on average, uh, I, my research and my clinical experience, which is extensive, shows that most people need eight hours of sleep at a night as an average. And many people have told me, oh, I don't need that much sleep. And they go off about how they study Tony Robbins and do sleep deprivation or all this other silliness. And I say, well, that's very interesting. Why are you sitting here paying me several hundred dollars an hour because you don't feel very good and you're telling me that you can go without sleep like that and I can track your sleep deprivation right to the problems you have no problem. So people just tell themselves all sorts of stories because they listen to people that don't really know what they're talking about and believe it. Um, you know, I've studied many courses by business experts, be it Jim Rohn and many others that all said if you didn't work 60 to 80 hours a week, you'd never become successful. Well, the only way you can do that is if you don't sleep. So, you know, and most people don't enjoy the work they're doing, so they don't really start living till they get home from work and they have to use their nighttime to wind down and, and reward themselves for the pain of living a life they don't want to live. So they, you know, drink alcohol and drink beer and smoke cigarettes and smoke piles of pot now and eat junk food to medicate themselves and end up going to bed at midnight or one in the morning and try to get themselves up in the morning to go to work. But right now, that's a very, very bad idea. Um, so, you know, the, the simple rule is, remember, you are what you eat and you are what you don't excrete. So if you eat toxic junk, that's what you make cells out of. And if you can't excrete the toxins because you don't have the nutrition on board, well, the more of it you have in your body, the more dysfunctional your body gets, the more crippled your immune system gets and overwhelmed it gets. So the point I'm making is ideally everybody needs eight hours of sleep at night. And I was trained in functional medicine for three years by one of the key pioneers of functional medicine, Bill Timmons, who founded Biohealth Diagnostics uh, right here in San Diego. And the research that he shared with me, which I've found to be clinically relevant, is that we need to follow the sun cycle because our cortisol rhythm is driven by the sun. So as the sun com comes up, cortisol, which is an activating hormone and stimulates the reticular activating system or the part of the brain that awakens you, follows the sun. And as the sun's going down and cortisol goes down, melatonin, which induces sleep and your anabolic hormones are more um, prominent at night, and they're tied right into the cortisol DHEA ratio, which is a ratio between a, an anabolic and, and, a, uh, and, and so cortisol is how you deal with the catabolic stress, tissue destruction, and DHEA is, is more on the anabolic side. So what Bill Timmons showed is that when we, when we go to bed, if we don't go down by about 10 o'clock at night, we cause problems because the physical repair cycle is the first four hours from 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. where the body focuses on repairing the physical tissues and structures of the body. And from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Is, is psychogenic repair. So there you have internal work like the brain re, re, repairing and the central nervous system repairing and balancing itself. And I've seen consistent, consistently in athletes who get to bed, say, at midnight and miss the first two hours of physical repair, that they have chronic nag nagging injuries all the time, from Achilles problems to tendon problems to back pains to muscle tears. And, and as soon as I get them to sleep right, a lot of that stuff clears up just from getting enough sleep. And I've worked with countless numbers of shift workers, such as nurses, who are uh, working all through the night and often um, working between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. and coming home and not going to sleep till like 6, 7, 8 in the morning. And they have chronic problems with headaches, cognitive disorders, and neurological symptoms. So my point is I've correlated my clinical experiments with Bill Timmons' research and observations that shows that 
we have to get to bed by 10 p.m. for our physical repair cycle, and that our psychogenic repair cycle starts at 2 a.m., and that's driven by the moon. So you have the sun driving cortisol and the moon driving our anabolic hormones and our growth and repair cycles. And I don't care who you are or what technology you're using. Your entire body is built on the principles of cosmic forces that include terrestrial forces or earth forces and extraterrestrial forces. The moon is an extraterrestrial force and so is the sun. Mm -hmm. so, so Paul, with people, words, sorry, just to jump in on that one. Yeah, so yeah. If, with people at the moment, then probably at home under stress, you know, losing jobs or risking losing jobs and financial pressures. Are, are you saying then if, if they've not got this just basic thing like sleep in place, that's gonna make that situation a whole lot worse than maybe what it could be just by getting getting your eight hours of sleep from 10 a.m. Well, they just call the, the challenge that we're facing right now an insult. If you add insult to injury, you're in bad shape. But the problem is most people are the source of their own injury by pure ignorance or lack of awareness of how to take care of a human body, which you must have awareness of basic nutrition, basic hydration, basic sleep, those are your anabolic or your feminine repair factors, breathing, thinking and movement are catabolic or typically um, there, you know, we breathe the fastest when we're working hard. We think the most when we're under stress. So we have breathing, thinking and movement. And if we don't get adequate movement, so if we under exercise or over exercise, we set ourselves up for trouble and hardly anybody's in the middle of paying attention to what their body needs. Most people are exercise addicted or they're just sedentary. <laughs> so because we, we have such a poor understanding and just to show you how corporate, uh, how corporate this Ill silliness is and how it's programmed into our, our, um, our government and into our corporate uh, policy, you know, in a corporate hijacking, C. Everett Koop, who was once the Surgeon General of the United States, once went on television because he saw how high chronic diseases were getting in the United States. And he said, it's important to realize that 90% of all chronic diseases are the results of lifestyle factors, such as diet and exercise, and the next day he was fired as the Surgeon General. <laughs> Why? Because if people actually knew what's in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthier, books like that and did it, there would be trillions of dollars lost in the medical and drug industry and related industries because people would be healthy and wouldn't need it. So the fact that the United States Surgeon General got fired for telling you that 90% of chronic illnesses were lifestyle issues tells you there's a corporate agenda much bigger than the concerns about your health and well-being. And, you know, you don't have to believe me or not. All you got to do is do your research into the coronavirus. Anybody that actually spends the time to do the research will find all the things I'm talking about. And whether it's true or not doesn't matter because all that matters at the end of the day is the world is the world. It's mm -hmm. always been this way. There's always been political agendas and rulers and kings messing with people and, you know, uh, plagues and viruses. So at the end of the day, it boils down to individual responsibility. If you know that you're in a world, let's just call it a dangerous world, well, by God, get yourself ready. If you were a kickboxer or a boxer, you wouldn't eat junk food and act like a fool all day because someone will knock the hell out of you in the ring. Yeah. Well, we're up against we're up against a corporate environment that doesn't have our best interests at heart. We're up against a political environment that's more interested in money than it is in people's health, obviously. Mm. Um, so what I'm saying is every day is a really good day to take care of yourself. And it's because I've done that that I have not missed a single day of work due to illness in 36 years. And people say, how do you do it? I do exactly what I teach. I wrote a book so you can do it for 25 bucks. Yeah. I developed so, an entire education system to teach people how to do it. So in t just, just a couple of other uh, quick things that you mentioned there. Then. So, so breathing, like we obviously assume that we all do breathing. But what, you know, what is, what, what, again, just as you've go, gone over for sleep, what's some simple things about correct breathing and, and why is that important for us to do like these all seems these are all simple things that don't cost any money for us for people no. to do but 
Yes, so, the answer is very simple. One, breathing, the diaphragm is the chief biological pump system in the body. Remember, you have muscular walls and arteries. They pump blood away from the heart to the tissues, but veins do not have their own muscles. So blood has to be returned back to the heart by muscular contraction. The chief pump system of the lymphatic fluid and the blood in the body is the diaphragm, your chief breathing muscle. If you don't breathe effectively, then your circulatory system is under more stress, which leads to high blood pressure is one of your first symptoms, but also your lymphatic system, which is kind of like a sewer system in a body. It removes dead proteins and, and the waste of immune antibodies after they phagocytized various uh, organisms and killed them in the body. So the lymphatic system is really like a cleaning system in the body and it's passive. It does not have an active pump mechanism other than breathing and muscle contraction, which is why getting 30 to 60 minutes of exercise a day is so critical because otherwise your circulatory and lymphatic systems begin to collapse and are under tremendous stress and your immune antibodies move through your circulatory system and your lymphatic system. So if either of those systems aren't working right, you're in trouble, and if you're not breathing well, then they're already in trouble 24-7. So the, one of the most important tips is to put one hand over your belly button, one hand on your chest, and when you inhale, the first two-thirds of the breath should come from belly expansion. So you, that's how you know the diaphragm's working, because to create a negative pressure in the lungs, it has to push the organs and glands and the, the, abdo the abdominal contents down, which is why your belly expands. So only in the last third should the chest begin to rise. Most people are all chest and no belly, and one of the unfortunate side effects of, of modern exercise silliness and all the crunching and chronic abdominal stuff is that people through the fashion industry have learned that to look beautiful, you gotta have your abs flexed all the time, and we've got all these crunch machines and crunch and crunch and crunch, which shortens the abdominal wall and tightens, and it restricts the ability for the diaphragm to drop down, which is why I told people how important the Swiss ball was, because if you don't exercise your abdominal wall through the full range of motion, and your spine extends 30 to 45 degrees behind the floor, you understand that? Mm -hmm. When you're doing a crunch, you can still expend, extend your spine 30 to 45 degrees, and a crunch on average is only 30 degrees of spinal flexion. So think of hitting a tennis ball. When you're going to serve a tennis ball or use a tennis ball, you're going way back into extension to accelerate the trunk, to accelerate the arm, to make impact with the ball. If you're throwing a spear or a baseball, you have to have thoracic extension. But what happens is when you keep exercising muscles in shortened ranges of motion, they drop sarcomeres and the muscle becomes functionally shorter. And if you do that through the abdominal wall, it, it stops you from being able to breathe properly because it pulls your chest and your head down and forward, crowds your organs. And if you walk around flexing your muscles <laughs> as a fashion statement, now your breathing gets very shallow and you can't get enough oxygen per breath. So your breathing rate speeds up quite high and when you can't get enough breath in, your brain will bring your head down and open your mouth, and you'll start breathing through your mouth, which is what you normally only do when you're running real fast. And that triggers the sympathetic nervous system to release adrenaline and cortisol because your body thinks you're running from a threat. <laughs> so stay away okay? from abdominal machines is the message there. <laughs> if, you're gonna, if you're gonna exercise your abdominals, you wanna do it through a full range of motion, which requires a Swiss ball so you can drop into extension. But my point is you need to stretch the abdominal wall. On my YouTube uh, channel, uh, youtube.com forward slash Paul Check Live, I put a I'll video put the links in there, in there for, for everyone as well. There, we'll, we'll share there's those. actually a, a video in there showing how to release your chest and your abdominal wall and your hip flexors using a foam roller so you can keep those muscles from getting too tight. So if you couple that, regular abdominal hip flexor and chest stretching and mobilization with a foam roller, proper functional conditioning as opposed to bodybuilding isolation type stuff and proper breathing, which I just taught. Now a technique I teach people that's very important in, a, in an environment like this where there's so much mental stress 
is if you just take a piece of kite string and tie it around at belly button level and tie it in a knot, not a bow, because a bow will slip, and set your clock, your phone, or a timer, or your watch to beep every hour on the hour, and every hour on the hour, you use the string as a feedback loop. So as you inhale, you expand your belly to purposely try to tighten the string so you can feel that your abdominal wall is expanding. And then you put your hand on your chest and you only let your chest rise after you've tightened that string as much as you can. And as you breathe in, you think the thought, I am growing toward the sun, which is a positive, I have growth potential. And as you exhale, you visualize yourself as a tree growing roots into the earth to stabilize you, which is a psychological symbol for being safe and secure. I call those centering breaths. I've worked with countless people with mental health disorders, anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, OCD, you name it. And I've never had a single patient that when practiced those centering breaths every hour for 12 breaths, didn't come back to me and say, oh my God, my mind's calmer than it's ever been. This is wild. How come nobody knows about this? Right? So it's super simple stuff, right? You can use a <laughs> and piece it's free. of pipe <laughs> and it's free, right? And so you eat real food, you drink well water, you sleep, you breathe properly. What's the best exercise in the world? It's the one you're willing to do every day. Yeah, I was going to come on to that. So, so in terms of movement and fitness, particularly as we're restricted to, you know, some people are restricted to small apartments and that, you know, what are, what are, you know, Paul checks tips on some things that we, you know, just basic stuff that we could be doing um, or that we well, need to be doing. Uh, there's a mi million of them, right? So uh, the simple one is a breathing squat right out of my book, how to eat, move and be healthy. I show all the zone exercises, which help balance the energy and charge your glands and organs in different parts of your body based on the tests that you take in the book. But a breathing squat is very simple. So all you got to do is stand up. For example, for people that don't go to the gym and don't know what a squat is, just stand with a chair back to the back of your legs like you were going to sit in a chair. Take a deep breath. As you exhale, slowly lower yourself down at the pace that you're exhaling. So and when your butt just touches the chair, inhale and slowly rise at the same pace that you're breathing. If your heart rate starts to speed up, don't squat so deeply. Only do what you can do without accelerating your heart rate or your breathing rate. What happens when you exercise, do any exercise, even walking at that intensity, so your heart rate and your breathing rate doesn't speed up, you actually cultivate more life force energy per unit of time than it costs to do the exercise. That's why I call it working in. Working out by definition means you're spending more energy and resources per unit of time than the exercise cultivates through the various mechanisms such as breathing, fascial. When you stretch fascia, it produces electromagnetic energy, which your body can use, pumping. Um, there's, a, there's a number of mechanisms that I could go through. I have a whole course on you know the science of breathing, excuse me, the, how exercise produces energy in your body. But... So you're saying slow and, down your intent, you know, just keep that intensity really slow. Um, is that, is yeah. that, and, and, and that's because it provides you more with more energy than, than yes. takes you. Yeah. Right. So what, what happens is by doing it, say a breathing squat like that, you're breathing deeply and properly. You're timing the rate of the breath with the rate of movement and you're keeping your heart rate and breathing rate consistent so it doesn't rise up. So for example, if all of a sudden you feel your heart rate speeding up or your breathing rate speeding up, just make it a half a squat. And after a minute, it's still going up, then make it a quarter squat. Even if you only squat one inch, just do a very slow one inch squat. So what happens is by doing that, you're timing the movement, which is the muscle pumping, the breathing together. And what research by heart math showed is it brings your brain, your heart, and your organs into biological rhythm and it makes your body go into a state of coherence or harmony and because the exercise is so easy when you put tension through muscles and pump oxygen through the bud like that it energizes you <laughs> right most people would have had the experience of stretching 
and getting up from stretching and feeling like they had a lot more energy than when they started stretching. That's because when you stretch fascia, it produces piezoelectric current, which is picked up by the meridians and brought into the body and put into the glands and the organs that need the energy to regulate themselves effectively. And this is well, well known, in, not only in Chinese medicine, but Dr. Jerry Tennant mapped it all out using the Chinese medicine system and measured it scientifically and proved it was true. Um, so the point is, stretching is a great way to mobilize your body, pump it, and um, give yourself more energy. But when you bring your brain, your heart, and your gut into harmony and you time your breathing and movement so your pump systems are working it enhances detox if you do it before bed you'll sleep a lot better and these are the exact principles that tai chi and qigong are built on at the foundation of all movement arts that are inner arts you find the harmony of breathing and movement and low intensity activity because then you're actually creating a surplus of life force energy, whereas working out creates a, a deficit in the system, which is why we have to recover after exercise. So are you we saying don't then have that, to recover that, from this? That, that you know, just l lower intensity just for, you know, people stuck in the home, or are you, are you just generally against high intensity exercise in general? For, for, well, for, you, you know, know better than person. that. I mean, Christ, there's a million videos of me kicking ass out there. <laughs> I lift great big friggin' stones and everything. No, it's about keeping it in balance. You know, you can, working out is great because it grows and strengthens the body. But if you do it more than you can compensate for by having adequate nutrition, adequate rest, and adequate resources, then you just perpetually break yourself down and then you're highly susceptible to coronavirus or flus or colds or anything. And one of the most common indicators of overtraining is, is respiratory tract infections of any kind. That's well documented in the medical research. Whenever athletes like in uh, marathon runners or triathletes are training too hard they're, or any athlete, they're most susceptible to respiratory tract infections. And lo and behold, the coronavirus shows up in your lungs first. <laughs> and if you're overtrained, remember, if you're sedentary, walking up a flight of stairs is overtraining for you. Mm -hmm. You can't even fight gravity. You're so weak. I've seen, I saw a research paper a few years back that looked at the actual fitness of the average person coming to a medical doctor's office and what it showed even blew me away. They found testing hundreds of people in medical doctor's offices that the average person hit their lactate threshold walking from the waiting room to the examination room. Okay, 50% of the people they tested hit their lactate threshold walking 40 feet. It's amazing. So, so no, I'm not against working out at all. It increases thermogenesis in the body. I mean, there's a myriad of hormonal and psychological benefits. But like anything, um, just because vitamin C is good doesn't mean you should eat it for dinner because you can screw yourself up just as mm. far worse than if you didn't eat it. Yeah. So, but, so you know, in, in, in terms of what's going on at the moment and people, I suppose, at home wanting to exercise, you know, really the key is just to protect yourself, work in, make sure you're, you're building your immune system so that, you know, when this has moved on, you, you know, you're, you're not putting yourself in a, in a dangerous position by you know, doing too much <laughs> by watching. I some can sort of summarize TV. it. I can summarize it very simply. I've said it a million times in lectures all over the world. Train, don't drain. Right. <laughs> Work out, but don't carry your addiction out or try to prove how, you know, superhero you are when you're in a world crisis where everybody's freaked out and and uh, highly susceptible to illnesses, which means that, you know, they're they're it's they're airborne pathogens. So if you know you have an invisible invasive force around then know that the best way to prepare for the enemy is not to leave yourself open to attack. So keep things more at a level of moderation. Get a great workout, but don't torture yourself. Mm -hmm. Get to bed on time. Don't overeat. Another thing that people do that's very uh, w strongly weakens the system is eating after seven o'clock at night. You're best to go to bed a little bit hungry. You'll get a much deeper sleep. Don't drink any caffeinated or stimulant type beverages after four o'clock in the afternoon, or you keep your cortisol levels way up high and you can't get into deep 
uh, sleep where your most restoration quality is. So going to bed a little bit hungry and not eating sweet stuff. Remember, one teaspoon of sugar will suppress immune antibodies for six hours. So what do most people do? They eat dinner too late, they drink coffee after dinner, and they eat a bunch of desserts, which completely disables their immune system. And then your glands and organs are working their ass off all night. So the body never gets a chance to repair itself on the inside. So it, a simple rule would be eat, eat a, a big breakfast, eat a good size lunch, but eat your smallest meal of the day for dinner and don't eat after seven o'clock at night. That way your body gets to rest at night. You'll wake up, you'll be leaner, your eyes will be brighter, your immune system will be stronger, your mind will be clearer, your sex drive will get better. I mean, that's the other thing. Right now we've got time to have lots of sex for God's <laughs> yes, sake. <right. laughs> you know, I got 19 year old and 18 and 19 year old athletes reaching out to me because they were trying to get off of Viagra and they're 18 and 19 year old. And they're, and I'm like, Jesus, when I was that age, I could have had sex 24 hours a day. <laughs> and so what I'm saying is most of this is due to bad diet, bad sleep and bad training technology. So now that you have time to sleep, and the other thing is use cold showers. They stimulate the body. They stimulate the cardiovascular tree. Your arteriovascular tree responds directly to temperature shifts. So when you get in a cold shower or an ice bath, the body's reaction is to send blood to the surface immediately. So the, art, the sympathetic system pumps blood to the surface. And then as you start to get cold enough to go numb, it triggers off a hunter's reflex, and then it pushes it into your core. So what happens when you use a cold shower for like six to 10 minutes? Now you shouldn't do this if you're already inherently cold, which means you're probably hypothyroid or you're getting sick. So nobody that's feeling sick should, should do that because it'll, it'll be too stressful for them. But most of us, I haven't taken a shower that wasn't ice cold in 16 years. <laughs> When I found out how it aided me and how it cleared my mind and enhanced my sex drive, I was like, oh my God, this is one of the best kept secrets ever. <laughs> in fact, when I'm over in Sweden in the wintertime, I go swimming in the ocean when it's frozen. Mm -hmm. The Swedes do that all the time. It's phenomenal. I mean, it'll freeze your balls off, but you get out and go have a sauna and it really invigorates the body. But the point I'm making is when you get in the cold water, the first thing the arteriovascular tree does is open up and push the blood to the surface. And then when you get cold enough, it pushes it back in. So if you think of a flower, the initial shock of the cold water is like a flower opening to the sun and it pushes its energy out. But when you get cold enough that you start to go numb, the flower closes, except instead of a flower, we're talking about the arteriovascular bed, right. the web, the web. So it actually strengthens the arteries, the veins, and the internal systems of the body. And we've gotten totally weak because we spend so much time indoors and temperature controlled everything. Our environments are way too controlled, right? People, people come to my classes and it starts raining and I say, okay, everybody take off your shoes. We're going out to do Tai Chi. There's a raining, it's raining, it's snowing. <laughs> I'm like, I got news for you. You're soaking wet on the inside already. <laughs> Grow up, grab some balls, get some ovaries. Let's go out and get some exposure and strengthen ourselves so we can be healthy people. We came from the wild, my God. Yeah. So final question then, Paul, like you mentioned the, the mind and the mindset and how that can, can affect us, you know, particularly if you're, if, you know, if fear is, is consuming your mind and, and, you know, the decisions yeah. you make based on that. So what are some of the things that we can do to, to strengthen us mentally, you know, what are some of the things you do? And I, I guess, you know, keeping sort of fairly, you know, keeping, I guess, religion out of this for, for the moment, but you know, is, is yeah. there any um, sort of simple tricks that people can use on that front as well? Yeah, whenever you're facing a, a, a challenging situation, you know, maybe you're getting into a heated argument um, with someone you love or a coworker, or you're, you're having an inner dialogue that's self negative, like, damn it, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do this? Why am I so lazy? So one of the things I teach my students is whenever you're facing an internal challenge or a relationship challenge like that, or a challenge with a person, place, or thing, ask yourself this question honestly. What would love do now? 
someone's irritating you, what would love do now? <laughs> you're, you're irritated because your husband keeps leaving his underwear on the floor and, <laughs> and the kids aren't putting their clothes away and your reaction is to scream and bitch and provoke a battle. Just say, what would love do now? Because in an environment like we're in, sweating the small stuff is a very bad idea. So a, a, a very rapid form of spiritual growth is always to ask, if I was love, what, how would I handle this situation? If I was love, how would I handle the, the coronavirus situation? Well, I would do my best to let people know that we're all in this together and that there's a lot of beautiful things happening. You know, I was just talking to one of my clients uh, that I coached from Boston last night and she said, Paul, you're not going to believe it. I've lived here for years. And she said, since this coronavirus restriction has been on, I've seen more kids out walking with their dads and their, <laughs> and their mothers and fathers and people spending time as families than I've ever seen. Yeah. I was coaching another client who lives on the beach in Malibu and he goes, Paul, you're not going to believe this, man. He goes, Californians obviously aren't scared of this virus. He said, Malibu Beach is packed to the gills right now. People are laying out in the sun, sunbathing. It's like, you know what? This is the most beautiful downtime. And if we just focus on sharing resources with each other, bartering if you're low on money, what can I do for you and what can you do for me? You got some milk, I can, you know, mobilize your spine or whatever your skill set is or you know but we can spend time together we can exercise we can enjoy education i mean the new chakiva website is up now where you got What's all sorts of What's uh, chakiva c h e k i v a dot com it's our new our new media site where we have piles of podcast videos stuff where people can get a massive health education for free from me and the Czech Institute instructors. You can listen to great podcasts, read good books. You can study inspirational material. You can listen to Eckhart Tolle, who's giving great information about how to deal with this crisis right now. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, take cold showers and have lots of great sex. You can, you know, play with your pets. You can, get clear on what in your life hasn't been serving you and say, you know, how am I going to change when this thing goes back to normal? And what have I learned from having this time off and being able to be with my friends and family? And we can all really think about, look, what are the things we're doing in the world collectively that we're not paying attention to that we really need to get together and use the same technological weapons that are being used against us to support us. You know, one of the key issues is I don't know if people are paying attention, but we're losing freedom of speech, which means we're no, we don't have a democracy anymore. Somebody put my, my video that I did on how to protect yourself from the coronavirus, they took the link from my YouTube and put it on Facebook, and within about an hour it was taken down. That's <laughs> censorship. And all I'm telling people is exactly this. Right now, I had COVID-19 coronavirus protection right in the title, uh, so don't title this coronavirus, or it's not <laughs> going to last long. But you see, my point is they're using technology to control us and manipulate us with artificial intelligence and all sorts of stuff, and that's well known. All you got to do is read the book Hook by Nir Eyal or listen to my podcast with him. Um, so I'm saying we got to use the technology to say, hey, here's where I found good food. Mm -hmm. Here's where I found good water. Here's a great book. You know, here's a, a, a scam I found out that the government's doing. You know, uh, let's not let them get away with that. We need to get our vote in on this. If we use the same technologies to connect to each other, support each other, and remember, we cannot be any healthier than the planet, and we've got to take care of the planet, and now is a chance to get out into nature and go for a walk. I mean, yeah, you don't, some of you are going to stay in your houses, but you got backyards. Some of you are going to be brave enough to say, look, I need to go get into the forest for a while. And I love know, that statement. You know, you can't be healthier than the planet. And I think we forget, you know, you, you don't realize that. Or you, 
I think we forget that is, is um, you know, and I think this is a perfect example for that statement, you know, and I'll, I will probably use that. Yeah. In the, <laughs> but you, you can't get any more healthy than the planet. You're right. <laughs> you just can't. You are the planet, right? Yeah. You are the planet. You are earth. You are water. You are fire, which the, it's the sunlight, which allows us to have metabolism. If there was no sun, there'd be nothing to eat. You eat that. And that's why your solar plexus is called the solar plexus. Solar means sun plexus. Your entire digestive system is controlled by a plexus called the sun plexus because it takes what was produced by photosynthesis, breaks it down and produces energy and nutrition out of it. So you can't be healthier than the earth. You can't be healthier than the water. You can't be healthier than your metabolism, which requires healthy food from healthy farming. And you can't be healthier than the air you're breathing. And you can't be healthier than the environment you're in because we're made of space too. We fill space. So while you got time from work, clean your office, clean your house, organize it, get rid of the garbage, make your environment beautiful so that what you're experiencing outside of yourself mirrors itself on the inside. We've got time to do all the things that we keep telling ourselves we don't have time to do. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the beautiful thing is if people do what I'm talking about, when the workforce goes back to work, people are going to be more creative, more vital, and more productive than they've ever been. And they're going to be more aware of how good it feels to rest, have time with family, make love, and get good edutainment, education that entertains. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Paul, I, I, I appreciate your time today. It's been fantastic. There's some really great stuff. And I, you know, rather than listening to all the stuff on the news, which I try and avoid because it just makes me feel like crap. I think if, you know, if, if people can listen to this and take just a couple of points away, then, you know, they're, they're going to at least, you know, feel a lot better and uh, be, be a lot better able to, to deal with this uh, crazy situation we're going through at the moment. So um, I'll make sure we put some posts to your book. Um, and, uh, you know, your YouTube channel, because there's some wonderful stuff that you're putting out there for free, uh, which, which is fantastic. Yes. And then, of course, Chikiva, there's lots of great stuff in it. We we were going to make it a subscription site. But as soon as this uh, viral epidemic hit, we decided to hold off so people didn't have to pay to get great education for free. So Chikiva.com. Chikiva. OK, we'll put, we'll put the links and into that. And of course, well. Checkinstitute.com. And my podcast is loaded with great stuff. Yeah. And what's the name of that one, Paul, again? Tech. Just if Living with 4D. No, Living 4D, number four, capital D, with Paul Check, which means Living the Four Doctors with Paul Check. And there's like 80 awesome episodes on all sorts of stuff loaded with great information. Yeah, there's some wonderful stuff on there. Well, once again, thank you, Paul. Appreciate your time and sharing your knowledge with, with everybody. And um, yeah, stay, stay strong. Amen, brother. It's the only way to go. <laughs> hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.